so I'm a PhD student. My supervisor is Dennis Sunnell. I don't know, maybe you're familiar. I think he's been to the symposium before. Um, he is the principal investigator for a grant called um, Developing Leaders in Science Teaching. So this uh, paper that, that I wrote that the presentation presentation is based on stems from my work with his fellows under his grant. Um, as I would, there are 15 of them. So as we were working with them, I noticed that there was a commonality with three of them. And so that, that was the inspiration uh, for this paper. So in the United States, and it sounds like this is worldwide based on uh, the symposium this week, that we don't have enough teachers. And so in the United States there, resorting to several different measures. You know, there are these emergency certificates, which they can basically give to anybody that are good for two years only. There are alternative certification programs, like we have Teach for America. Sounds like maybe that's similar to Teach for Australia. Um, during COVID, which kind of happened after um, I got to know these teachers, um, our school system started using the, uh, the pre-service intern teachers in the classroom to fill the need, uh, you know, because there were such a shortage of the teachers um, or they hire substitute teachers. And these substitute teachers come with zero qualifications other than the fact that they're willing to accept uh, a paycheck. So we have this vast landscape of uncertified um, teachers in the classrooms. So our participants are part of this um, federally funded grant. Um, we call it LIST. And the whole uh, focus is then to provide high quality science or STEM teachers in general um, into classrooms. Um, we're working toward you know, promoting their teacher leadership. We want to create these partnerships you know, between the local schools and the university. So um, it's a, it starts as a scholarship program and, and I'll talk a little about the details of that. They're, these are people who have a degree a science degree. And we are recruiting them to say, hey, come add a, an education degree, like a master's, an next degree, so that you're endorsed in education on top of your content, content expertise. And then at the end of this accelerated master's program that we put them through, they do get um, you know, state certification to be teachers. But we don't just stop there. We go ahead and continue on. We give them uh, some more induction courses, some more um, graduate level coursework to increase their capacity as teachers. And then we also have um, a professional learning community that we build with them and we follow with them uh, like four to six years. So they're getting this continued uh, longitudinal support uh, through our program to help kind of build their identity as teachers. One of the stipulations um, for the stipend that they receive is that they have to teach in a high need school. So that's going to be a school that's high poverty, um, high uh, uh, marginalized population, so that we can take these, you know, very highly qualified science people that have now been trained to be true educators and trying to fit the the need, you know, in these in these schools that typically are not getting um, that quality of teacher. A little bit about the, the professional learning community that we help them build. So they we have we encourage them to find a teacher at their school. Um, when they first start, it's usually their mentor teacher at that school that's, a, that's assigned by their school system. Hopefully, it is another science teacher, but not always. Um, we've had them where it was a you know a trusted colleague who was an English teacher or math teacher. Then we uh, attach with to their team a science professor from the university. And the reason for that is because um, there's sometimes a disparity with their content knowledge. So uh, Jim talked about this yesterday, the qualifications for being a highly qualified teacher is um, contingent on a, a national exam. And there are all these different topics they can take. So they can take the biology exam or the physics exam to, to earn their qualification as an educator along with their certification. But there's also one called the uh, General Science Certificate, which you know says you're highly qualified in all the sciences. But are everybody trained in all of the sciences? Typically, they're a biology major or a chemistry major. But they take this test, which increases their marketability. So then they get hired, and now they're out of field. So you'll have a student, oh, I have a biology major, and the school hires them and says, great, now you're our chemistry teacher. 
So what we do with the science specialists is we will find a, a chemistry professor to be on their team to then guide them into building um, that content background that they need, that they're lacking. And then the education specialist, which is somebody from the grant, and we are coming in as, as the education experts to help them with their, their pedagogy. Okay, so this study is just an ethnography. Out of the 15 participants, three of them had similar backgrounds. They were they had science degrees and they were hired as teachers and they had zero credentials um, in education. And each of them sought our program because individually they wanted to have you know, that background um, as an educator, but they were working as teachers while they were doing that. So typically um, our participants have graduated with their first degree with their bachelor's degree in science. They stay in school for that year to get their master's. They do their pre-service internship and then they go into the classroom. But these three teachers were already working uncertified and going to school at the same time in order to earn that certification, which I felt put them in a very um, unique um, situation. So just to highlight a few of, um, of the participants, um, Senna was somebody who was hired at a school that was not meeting state standards. It was a very high minority population school, very low income population school. And they, you know, they, the school made the decision, let's just hire anybody. This person has a science degree, we'll hire them. She had a degree, a master's degree in geology and they assigned her to teach their advanced chemistry courses. So um, she did have some experiences, you know, like she was working at a museum and she was doing little workshops um, and she had had some time as um, a teaching assistant working on her degree. So that kind of gave her a little bit of an idea, but that's not the same thing as being in a classroom with secondary students um, and especially teaching chemistry as opposed to doing a tour of, you know, young adults at a museum. Haley is my next participant. Um, she was recruited by a friend to work at a rural school. The, the friend was like, hey, I'm on this emergency certificate. They need a science teacher. You have a science degree. Why don't you come do this? She'd been working as a field biologist. And she was like, great, let me come try this. And so she steps into the classroom um, where she had previously been helping with some uh, elementary science lab work while she was doing her field biology work. So it really was a, a switch you know, in, in her venue there to become an actual science teacher. And then under that same emergency certificate, she changed schools, um, she moved. And so she changed schools, again, emergency certificate. So she still has her science degree, no science credentials. And then she came looking for our program because she wanted she wanted to have that, that background. And then my last one, Nora, she was working at a private Christian school and private Christian schools are not required to for there to be any certification they only have to be endorsed by that church and so she was teaching a variety of things she was teaching science classes math classes latin music she was you know kind of a jack of all trades but didn't feel like she had like the research based practices that she needed to be truly effective and that's why she sought out um, our program so we're saying that in order to create um, this science teacher identity, that the factors that, that play into that are the, their self-efficacy, their professional practices, and their pedag pedagogical content knowledge. So our guiding questions were, um, what are these teachers' attitudes concerning their situation of being in a classroom and not actually being a teacher yet? And then did their methods change over time through, throughout their program? So, um, in terms of their self-efficacy, I'll just run through each participant because they, they said some key things. So Santa was saying, you know, she felt like she had support from her coworkers, um, but she still didn't know how to be a chemistry teacher. She just felt out of, you know, fish out of water. And um, she said here, um, I definitely did not feel like I knew what I was doing in any way. Every day was a struggle and my goal was simply to survive. If I could make it through a day without any major mishaps, I called it a victory. And really in those terms, I don't think she's talking about the chemistry. I think in those terms, she's talking about um, student behavior. So she just felt like um, she was focusing on what she was doing and not focusing on what her students needed and what they were learning. Haley, initially, you know, and I think 
this this tracks with some of the research. She had high self-efficacy. She felt like she was doing great. She had these teachers at this rural school who were giving her um, materials and emotional support. She thought she was doing great. Once she started the program is when she learned all the things that she didn't know that she thought she knew. And so her in, in her reports, so her self-efficacy actually dropped. And then by the time she uh, gained her full certification, it was starting to increase again. So she went through this whole cycle with her self-efficacy. Um, again, so in her situation, she is uh, by herself. She's the only science teacher at her school. And I think that that has um, added to her struggle with the self-efficacy because she didn't have anybody to go to next door. Hey, how do you teach this concept in science? Because she was the science, one science teacher for the whole uh, rural school. Um, Nora was the one who felt like, um, she just wasn't comfortable in things outside of her area. Her area was geology. We don't actually teach geology as a standalone course in the state of Alabama. There's earth science, which has a component of geology. And so Nora's position at the public school where she was hired after the private school uh, was to teach eighth grade physical science, which incorporates like um, rudimentary physics and chemistry concepts. Um, she just felt like she didn't have the content. Now, her, similar to the way Haley's did, her self-efficacy did kind of ebb and flow as she went through the program. Now we're seeing an increase as she's gaining more and more experience. And then she was the one that specifically said, I'm looking for research-based practices. I can't, she's, she felt like I can become a good teacher, but I'm, I'm gonna have to work on it and it's gonna take a lot of time. If I can get a degree, maybe I can fast track you know, my expertise. So she says she just didn't wanna grow through trial and error. Their professional practices, that was the second element. Um, we went through and I kind of took note from them like what they used before they came through and got their degree versus the sorts of resources they had once they were part of this organized program and they had their, their full uh, education diploma. So before they were really just dependent on very limited things, other teachers, the other teachers lesson plans, um, very dependent on the textbook itself or whatever the, the school system said, these are your standards, you must cover this, they stuck to that. But they weren't really trying to you know, expand those student-centered practices. Once they were certified as teachers, once they had gone through a teacher education program and once they had our support from our grant, they had access to a lot more resources. For example, we pay for their membership to NSTA, the National Science Teacher Association, and there's all of their resources online um, and their conferences and webinars. Our state has something called Science in Motion, which is apparently unique. I went to some training in Colorado one time and they had never heard of anything like it, but the state um, houses science equipment which they carry out to schools who request it. They have special training programs in the summer and it just gives, it augments what maybe the schools are lacking in terms, especially in terms of equipment. And then that's also another way that um, these teachers are, especially out of content teachers are getting that support they need. Like they're teaching chemistry. So this science and motion program brings them chemistry equipment. They bring them the training. They bring an expert to kind of guide them through how, this is how you do these labs with these chemistry students. Um, and so we're very grateful that our state funds that, that program. I, I did not know how unique that was. And then we've got um, our PLC team for them where they meet monthly. They can ask questions about classroom management, content, anything they need, they get to design uh, the agenda. And then they have these experts, education science experts that come and, and give, you know, share their expertise to then guide them. Um, and then of course they have now the, from the teacher education program that feeds into more student-centered planning, you know, research-based, um, pedagogy. And then finally, their pedagogical content knowledge. I brought some quotes from them. Nora said, being a really good scientist and good communicator does not automatically make you a good teacher. So I think that that self-realization uh, really added to her growth because then she was able to, um, to realize, oh, I need expert help. 
and, and I'm going to get that. Haley says, you really do not know how you will act in certain situations until you are in them. And teaching is one of those. And I think that all of us who have been in classrooms know that that is certainly true. And, you know, a lot of things you just have to learn on the job. So the teacher education program can prepare you. This is what to expect with classroom management, you know, but then you get into the classroom and it's always going to be a little more uh, dynamic. And so, um, we feel like that with the support that we're providing them, these the PLC uh, teams in particular, maybe they are not feeling as um, vulnerable and, and building up uh, on their PCK as they go. And then Senna said, my ability to plan effective lessons and use data effectively has come from going uh, through my teacher education program. So she gave a lot of credit to the formal um, college degree in education. In, uh, in the literature, the alternative um, certification programs such as Teach for America, you know, they are maybe implemented differently in different places. This article said, look, if you're going to be effective, if you're going to take these, you know, out of field teachers and, and put them in the classrooms and these uncertified teachers, you should do these things. You should provide them housing assistance. You need to provide them salary assistance. You need to, you know, support them. And, and it lists here um, all the things that could be formalized in a program. So what we did is we did and compared our program to those recommendations. And we feel like um, we are kind of matching those recommendations with maybe just that little bit extra, especially we feel like this PLC team of ours um, is a huge component toward these teachers uh, gaining all of the, the self FTC and the practices and the, and the PCK. Um, they like the money, the money helps because uh, you know, I'm sure the situation is the same worldwide. Teachers are not paid what they're worth. And so we're trying to just supplement that a little bit to, to make sure that they, to retain them. So this just, uh, in general, my paper was just exploring, you know, that the fact that their skills and their confidence did increase once they received formal training from, you know, before when they were just kind of teaching on their own to when they were actually trained to be teachers and then had the support of the LIST program. Um, so we're, we're implying that uncertified teachers um, are more likely to lack that actual teacher identity, right? That they're not gonna have as developed, certainly not in the beginning, the self efficacy, the PCK, that while our participants said, well, yeah, we think we could have earned that over time, it sure was better to have proper training. Um, and then we maintain that, of course, that the best science teachers are going to have the strong science background, so their own degree in science, a rigorous teacher education uh, training program, and then also mentored experience in the classroom. And one of the things that our, our three participants were lacking was that mentored experience because the school system was saying, yeah, go ahead and do your um, master's in education, but you're your own intern. So they did not have a, a proper supervisor in the classroom with them while they were going through their internship, but we brought that to them. We brought that to them with, the, with our, um, you know, we were observing them and we were supervising them. And then also we brought them those PLC teams to kind of make up for the fact that they were doing things unconventionally and kind of catch them up where, you know, the regular uh, teacher education program students would have been. I probably talked too fast, sorry. Um, but does anybody have any questions about what I'm, I'm talking about? 